Hello, world. Welcome to Talk with Clats. My name is Katie Ann, and I will be your host for today. We have a special, 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 extra special. You see how many specials I gave you, Roland? Um, so doc, his name is Dr. Roland Joseph. Dr. Joseph is a recent graduate of Nova Southeastern University, where he successfully earned a PhD in conflict analysis and resolution. He is going to discuss what his dissertation topic was with us. Uh, Dr. Joseph has an interest in conducting research in the non-killing paradigm and nuclear weapons issues. He is a member of the research committee in non-killing security and international relations at the Center for Global Non-Killing. He was also a former journalist and political analysis in Haiti for numerous radio, radio stations, hear my accent coming out, and newspapers for over 15 years. He was also a former instructor of Introduction to Political Science, and he has also coordinated and led training sessions on peace, nonviolence, non-killing, and conflict resolution at Haiti's Caribbean Center for Global Nonviolence and Sustainable Development. Dr. Joseph, welcome to Talk with Clad. We're so excited to have you today. Thank you, Kilian Binard. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be with you today. So I'm here to, to, to answer your questions about my experience promoting non-killing paradigm in Haiti, in the United States. And I am here to share my experience conducting and uh, research in the field of non-killing studies um, as part of my dissertation. So congratulations in completing your PhD. I know that is an extraordinary accomplishment, Dr. Joseph. Thank you. Uh, and let's see, what is your, or what was your dissertation topic? My dissertation topic was about the, cha the challenge and um, transformative experience of promoting non-killing political science to entire nuclear weapon activist and realist. Oh wow, that, that that's a big situation. That's a big topic that you took on. You know, that that's really a big topic. Yeah. So I would really like for listeners to hear about your story and how your background played a part in that story. So tell us a little bit about your background growing up in Haiti. And what role did your parents play in your pursuit of your education? Great question. So I think I was born in Haiti uh, and grew up in Haiti, child of in, in a family of five uh, children. So I studied uh, uh, political science in Haiti. I, I mean, I would say that my bachelor's degree, you know, and I have a certificate in journalism and communication. So my career, I work of for, for, for all of my entire life, I work as a journalist, a reporter, a newsroom director in Haiti, a writer, and then uh, that's it uh, for Haiti. So I used to work uh, too as a community organizer uh, in Haiti for the organization that you just mentioned, the Center for Global Nonviolence and, and Sustainable Development. So um, that was what I did when I was in Haiti. And I have to mention that uh, my parents, <laughs> my mother, and my dad, they are all um, educated uh, uh, people. They, 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 they had no chance as I had uh, to go to, to school. And I can tell you that my mother, my father, they can't even identify their names, you know. And that is sad. But uh, what is important is they they knew that they had to, uh, to, to push us, push us to go to school, they encourage us to go to school and, you know, uh, um, Caribbean parents or you know, even people from my country, they want their children to go to school, you know, yeah. the new generation. So um, I have to thank my, my family uh, for that. But 
when I moved to the United States in in uh, October 2013, I studying pursuing my study here, and I got a math, as you mentioned, a master's degree in peace and conflict uh, studies from uh, the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Uh, before uh, I, I I began my PhD at Nova Southeastern University. University. Okay, so you were one of five. Your parents were uneducated, but they saw the need or the importance of an education. And then you mentioned that you've been a journalist. You were a journalist for multiple news right. stations, right? So what what made you decide to become a journalist when you were in Haiti? It's a good question. So that was a, a long history. When I was in high school, uh, I remember uh, I had... Uh, three friends, two classmates. We used to organize our class in a way, and then we tried to to uh, to 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 read the news about what happened in the world and in Haiti. So we we talk as a journalist, like a um, let me say that in French. Madame, Monsieur, bonsoir, bienvenue uh, à notre émission, something like that. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon. You know, we used to do that, to do that in in school, in high school. So that was uh, my first um, motiv motivation. And then second, I think I used to hear uh, some uh, famous uh, Haitian journalists uh, like uh, uh, Valérie Numa and Dali Valle and Nancy Walk, Haitian journalists. They uh, they inspired me to to become journalist and you know mm -hmm. it is very difficult in Haiti uh, when uh, 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 when you are young uh, like a teenager and you decide you said okay you know what mommy I'm going to study journalism your parents will not let you study journalism they will encourage you to study medicine they will uh -huh. you to, to, they want you to become a economist engineer other prestigious, I mean, uh, 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 profession, you know, uh, they don't know, my mother didn't want, want me to study journalism. What is that? You are not going to make money. Oh, so, yes. well, that was my <laughs> choice. I want yeah. to become a journalist and I'm, I'm, I, I, it was a good thing for me. So when I moved to the United States in 19, in, in 2013, it was, I said, well, you have to be in academia, okay? Because it is difficult to make a living in the United States as a journalist because I wasn't, oh. living, you know? So I tried to, 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 to another career. I, I want to choose another career. Not another career. career. Yeah. Okay. So can you share any interesting or impactful experiences from your journalism career that helped to shape your interest in conflict resolution? Oh, this is interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I would say, um, yeah, because I'm by nature a peaceful man. I'm by uh -huh. nature a peaceful man. Uh, I love peace. And then in my profession, I prioritize communication and, you know, conflict resolution and peace studies is about communication. So, and even I prioritize in the community and dialogue, uh, peaceful means of addressing conflict, you know, that's what I used to, I used to do. And, I, I can't remember a specific uh, anecdote that can uh, that I can tell you uh, pushing me toward the, the the field of peace and conflict studies and communication. But I wanted also to be a political analyst because uh, uh, when you study uh, journalism, uh, you are not only a simple, uh, I would say, reporter or a writer, you can be also a, a political analyst, an editorialist, uh, so many things. So the political science I studied uh, helped me to, to analyze 
political issues, not only in my country, Haiti, but also in, in the United States, in America, in Asia, whatever happening in the world, I can, you know, analyze that in my uh, talk show, you know, and yeah. the radio stations used to invite me to, to, to analyze, for example, the U.S. election, presidential election, the French uh, presidential election. I used to 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 give my take on these uh, different uh, uh, talk shows. You know what I mean? So uh, there's a I, I try I make connection between political science and journalism, and even with uh, the field of peace and conflict resolution studies. Okay. So then, how did your experiences in Haiti? shape your perspective on conflict, violence, and nonviolence. I can tell you the story. My professor, Dr. Max Paul, he passed away, unfortunately, in 2017, no, 2014 or 2015, something like that. I don't remember exactly the date. He introduced some concept to his students. At the time, I was student in political science. Concepts like nonviolence, peace, you know what I mean? Nonviolence, peace, and even non killing. In, it was in, in 2004, 2004, 2005. And that was where I first heard about the concept of non killing political science. And then uh, he, he was my anthropology uh, professor, and he became my friend. And then I became a member of his Center for Global Nonviolence and Sustainable Development. I received a training trainer uh, at his center. And then that was where I, uh, at that time, I, I, I became a trainer in the field of nonviolence, peace, uh, conflict resolution. And then I started um, um, uh, training other young people in high school and even organizing some training for community in the field of peace, uh, conflict resolution, dispute resolution. So that was, that, that, uh, that is the beginning of my, uh, I mean, experience with uh, conflict resolution. So what led to you pursuing a PhD? Yeah, um, when I moved to the United States in the, in 2013, I went to the University of Massachusetts Lowell. I had no intention to get a PhD in conflict resolution. That was not my my, my goal. So you know, after uh, finishing my thesis, and I, I I I talked to a professor. I said, "Well, okay, uh, academia in the United States is difficult, but I think you can do it." So I began to um, explore the field uh, or different program in conflict resolution in the US and I apply at Nova Southeastern University and I have been accepted there. And then I, I got my PhD here. So in conflict resolution. So I'm so happy for this um, journey. And then some of my, some of my professors they, uh, they pass away. So I think they would be happy about this achievement. Yeah, yeah that, that's really, real. Dr. Joseph, a, an amazing achievement to, to have your PhD. So while you, you got accepted into NOVA, why did you choose this dissertation topic? Did you have another topic? How did you settle on this specific topic? I'm the very big, uh, I started the program in 2018. So... Uh, uh, a professor um, suggested, Roland, you have to, you need your topic before even you start. I said, okay. And I take, okay, Roland, why don't you continue on non killing? Because I have, I had the opportunity to share this concept, non killing, political science or non killing to other students, even in Haiti and at the University of Massachusetts. And students used to challenge me by asking questions, I would say not 
stupid question, but they used to say, ah, non-killing is something that is unthinkable, like it is a utopia, you know? They used to tell me things that can discourage me. But there's someone who told me, Roland, you know what? Non-killing is a great, great topic to pursue at Nova Southeastern University because it is new. Not only yeah. people know it. That is yes. an original topic. You have to do it. That's why. Okay, that's why you chose that. Yeah. So when when that is what most of my homework, I did most of my homework based on my topic, either non-killing political science or nuclear disarmament. I will tell you more about that later. If my professor gives me no work, a, a book review, I email them and ask them. Dear professor, can I use this topic? Can I use this book? Uh, can I write my essay on a topic related to my topic, <laughs> to my dissertation topic, yeah. which is um, non-killing nuclear disarmament? And that's why when I finished my dissertation, with my coursework, it was a uh, difficult for me to just go forward so i because you already had the research exactly. information already exactly i have all the all, all of my paper written here and then just reading i do not i did not copy and paste but just you know i yeah. i had i had a clear idea of what i wanted to do that's an actually great advice <laughs> and, and very very smart so how do you define, because you said the concept of non-killing, non you know, it's there, but it's not very popular. So how do you define non-killing and what distinguishes it from other forms of non-violence? Um, to define non-killing, I would say non-killing political science right, or non-killing global society. We have to mention the name of Glenn DePage the scholar, the American scholar who created, who coined this concept. Who was Page? Page was an American political scientist. He developed this concept in, uh, I would say, 1974. Three words came to him. Three words has or have transformed him. Those words are no more killing. No more killing. <laughs> Why no more killing? No more killing because Page used to kill. He was a U.S. soldier. Oh, that's interesting. He served, he served as a soldier in the Korean War, I think in 1950, 1952. Page, Kedian, even defended war he was for war. In other words, Page was for killing. Page was for violence. Mm -hmm. He had voted for violence because he had been trained as a soldier. In, so how did he get to non killing? In 1974, three words came to him. Three words have transformed Page. No more killing. And then this transformation will lead him to create the concept of non-killing. He spent, I would say, 30 years conducting research on this concept. He asked a question, a simple question. He said, is a non-killing global society possible? Is it possible to achieve a society in which there is no weapon made or created to kill. That was his question. He spent 30 years conducting this research by interviewing political scientists, the mentoring political scientists, mm -hmm. those who believe in the philosophy of for example, Plato, Aristotle, Thomas, Thomas Hobbes, Max Weber, those thinkers, political thinkers, they all, you know, defend killing in politics. They believe that, like Machiavelli, Niccolò 
cavalry. They believe that killing is normal in politics. And finally, the answer of Page to his simple question is, yes, it is possible to achieve a society where there is no weapon to kill. A non-killing society for Page is a society where a, 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 a community local to global where there is no weapon made to kill, no condition conducive depend open uh, the threat of killing with, uh, with, with weapon. This kind of society includes also nuclear weapons. And that's why I, and I try to connect um, non -de 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 the concept of non-killing with that. So then can you elaborate on the role of anti-nuclear weapon activists and realists in promoting non-killing? How do their personal perspectives and actions contribute to a broader movement? The first reason that um, I, I was uh, interested in conducting my research on non-killing and anti-nuclear weapon activists, anytime I raised this concept in class or uh, with friends, with colleagues, with sc other scholars, researchers, I said, well, um, non-killing society is impossible. It is not possible. One of the reasons they, 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 they put forward is the risk of killing associated with the existence of nuclear weapons. And that is one of the reasons I tried to connect that, to investigate the experience of scholars at the Center for Global Non-Killing as they promote this concept to others, including anti-nuclear weapon activists and realists. An anti-nuclear weapon activist is someone who advocates for the elimination of nuclear weapons. An anti-nuclear weapon activist is not necessarily for the elimination of all weapons like in like a non-killing activist. A right. non-killing activist is for the elimination of all weapons, including... Anti-nuclear? Okay. But a realist is for the existence. They believe, realists believe that force is necessary. War is necessary. We have to prepare for war. Like we, like a, an, uh, an old adage, uh, a, 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 a Latin... Um, an old adage that say si vis passem palabellum si vis passem palabellum in Latin uh, uh, adage if you want peace prepare for war if you want peace prepare for war si vis passem pala, palabellum that is realist we have to we need military we need army we need mm -hmm. to prepare to kill so I used to say si vis passem pala passem which means if you want peace, prepare for peace. Or if you <laughs> want peace, prepare for non-killing peace. Hence, the need to educate the society, the global society, from Page perspective, Kerian. Page said people kill in politics. They do. They kill in politics because they have been trained to kill. So to not kill, we have to train people to not kill. That's why this new paradigm, the non-killing paradigm is important. If you start educating young people, educating kids, educating professors about the concept of non-killing, they will become non-killing leaders. No, no, so I was going to ask you because, you know, when you talk about politics and killing, non-killing, right? Because war is a big business, mm -hmm. you know, so what were some of the ethical or moral or philosophical arguments that you use to support the promotion of non-killing or you would use to support the, the promotion of non-killing to someone who's a realist? Absolutely. Uh, usually people from uh, uh, the realist school, they put forward the economic scarcity that leads to conflict and they respond to them in one way. A non-killing global society is not a society free of conflict, but a society in which human beings will not use uh, violence and killing to address conflict. Because conflict is inherent. 
to human beings. We have the capacity to not use violence, to not use force to address conflicts. We have this capacity. You have it. I have it. And Page used to say, the majority of human beings are not killers. The majority of human beings are not violent. That is one of the, uh, the arguments developed, uh, developed by Page in his seminal book, Non-Killing Global Political Science, uh, which is translated in, into more than 34 languages, including Haitian Creole. And I had the opportunity to translate this book from French version to Haitian Creole. Oh, wow. Yeah. So Dr. Joseph, in your research, did you encounter any resistance or skepticism towards the concept of non-killing and how did you address or navigate these challenges? As I've conducted my research? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, um, the challenge I met was not, can I say challenge, but, you know, I, I interviewed the non-killing, I, I would say people in the field of non-killing. Uh, that's why it wasn't uh, challenging. The challenge was at the level of finding or uh, the right participant to answer my research question or my interview questions. That was the challenge. It was sometimes difficult to find him because it was not like about non-killing, only about non-killing, but it's still about non-killing and nuclear disarmament. But at the center, it might be difficult to find appropriate respondents, scholars who are used to promote specifically the concept of non-killing to anti-nuclear weapon activists and realists. So I address that by reviewing my uh, the protocol, uh, the RB uh, protocol, and contacting my uh, my chair, and then I try to make it a, a easier <laughs> for me to find appropriate respondents for my research. You know, so I I I, I included um, uh, scholars who used to promote nonviolence. Nonviolence is a is a concept related to 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 non-killing, but pay, but non-violence is more complicated to understand than killing, or the concept of violence is difficult to understand. To to to, to, to understand, it is, it is difficult to understand it because non-killing just do not kill. That's it. But even it yeah. encompasses a, a structural violence as conceptualized by by. Uh, Joan Galton, you see what I mean? Spiritual yeah. violence, I mean, uh, invisible violence, you know? So from Page perspective, um, uh, this concept, non-killing, encompasses sexual violence as defined by, by, by Professor Galton. So as I hear you speak about Page, you get so excited when you're speaking about, like about what his, Page, to Page? Yes, because I mean him. In Haiti, <laughs> in my country. Oh, you got to meet him because I'm like, there's such excitement there when you were speaking about the research. I was yeah, like, well, I mean, that must have, mm -hmm. have been a transformative experience for you. Exactly. Uh, the, 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 the experience of Paige transformed me. You know, when I meet Paige, Paige, I mean, influenced my professor, Dr. Maxwell, and Dr. Maxwell uh, uh, transformed Roland. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that is, I believe that this society can be transformed. Yeah, this society. Why people kill? Why do you kill others? Why do you spend trillion dollars, billion dollars to kill other human beings? Why? Why do Russia, the United States of America, Israel, um, France, uh, UK, why do people to kill, to destroy the planet? Man, what, what your research right now would be so applicable or is applicable Absolutely. to what is going on right now. You know, like we have different wars that's going on, but I, I would be curious, like if they, if this was something that was taught in schools as, hey, let's look at versus the anti-nuclear weapons, let's look at a non-killing um, solution first. Yes. You know, before the loss of, loss of life. So what you're doing right now is so, so applicable um, to what's going on in the world. 
So let's go back to transformative experiences. Mm -hmm. So what are, I, I've heard about Dr. DuPage. I am seeing your excitement when you speak about it. So what were some of the transformative experiences you encountered during your research journey? And can you share some examples or stories that highlight the challenges and transformative experiences you encountered while working with like your realist or your anti-nuclear weapon act activities or um, people who who advocate for, for non-killing? And, and DuPage is one of them. Um, good question. I think uh, one of the, most of the participants used to kill before becoming non-killing figures or scholars and they used to kill and they uh, they they didn't even know about the concept of non-killing before meeting Paige. And they acknowledged that Paige transformed their lives, transformed them from killing to non-killing. I interviewed someone who a, a great scholar in the field of nuclear weapons. So he told he told me when it, it was very difficult for him to accept this concept. And then when Page presented with some evidence that it is possible in this society <clears throat> where people do not kill, he said he he became convinced that you know this concept can this concept can be you know uh, he accepted this concept in 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 his field and he wrote about it. So. So many um, participants uh, mentioned that, and that's why, I, I, as I just told you, I'm convinced that we can um, achieve uh, a planet where there is no weapon to kill. Uh, we can have a non-killing uh, political science. Uh, we can have a political science where non-killing is the foundation. Non-killing is the main value uh, of this discipline. <clears throat> Not only uh, political science, even <clears throat> uh, conflict, peace and conflict studies, uh, non-killing can be uh, a key value for this for our field, you know, um, because people think that they go, uh, they, they they enter in war, uh, they they use weapons against another country, uh, this condition of conflict, you know, use weapon to kill others. That is a way of addressing conflict. No, so non-killing supposed to be a key value in our field, peace and conflict resolution studies, mm -hmm. meaning what? It means that you are not going, I'm going to negotiate with you, but no killing, no killing, no weapon. We are not going to, to use weapon. That is the principle, the principle of, 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 of the basics uh, of, of our discipline of social sciences. And Paige mentioned that in his book, who can achieve a non-killing global society if scholars like you, Kedian, uh, students embrace the concept of non-killing. And that's why at the Center for Global Non-Killing, you, you have different research committees, international relations research committee, political science, non-killing political science research committee, non-killing uh, uh, non psychology, non-killing anthropology, non-killing international relations, and so on. You know, all human beings supposed to try to, all scholars supposed to try to, uh, uh, have to try to, I mean, uh, connect this concept with their own academic disciplines. Oh, I, I'm ha so happy you, you mentioned that. So can you discuss the role of education and awareness in promoting non-killing? How can individuals and communities be encouraged to embrace non-killing as a way of life? Because they always say, especially for Americans, um, that they, we always choose war. So how can we switch and how does education play a, a role in that? Listen, there will be non-killing. There is no non-killing global society without a non-killing global uh, scientific project. Right. And to have a non-killing global scientific project, we need to start educating people. Or in the non-killing global scientific project, we, project, we have to insert these aspects of non-killing education. Peace education is good, 
but non-killing is education is better because peace yes. is like because you know uh, Kenyan people who kill or who, who use who, who use violence they talk about peace too as I mentioned earlier si vis passem parabellum if you want peace people people war this is complicated what does that mean we have the capacity to not kill but you have to help them discover this capacity help them discover that you have the capacity you have it you, you can kill yes of course you can kill but you cannot kill too you have the capacity not to kill so that is the world of the education okay non so education so at that time in the united states of america in every school or everywhere in the world, they should initiate this concept, non-killing education, you know? Because even in the movie that uh, kids watch, you have to initiate that. No, do not to kill. Do not, do not kill. Don't kill. So kill becomes normal. So don't non-killing should become normal in the yeah. minds, in the mindset of, of all human beings. We can achieve it. It is achievable. So how do you see the concept of non-killing evolving in the future? Do you see any emerging, while you were doing your research, did you see any emerging trends or developments that you find particularly promising for I, use in the future? Yeah, I, there is a great future for this concept as the world is at risk of killing every day, either or with nuclear weapons, climate change a conflict in the Middle East and everywhere in the world, in Africa, there's a great picture. And there is a, it is, there is a demand for that, for, for all of those problems, you know, issues in the world. And the answer, the right answer for now, as you just mentioned, is not killing. That is why there's a great future for that. Uh, even though some political scientists prefer adopt, adopting or embracing the mainstream political science characterized by war, characterized by violence, characterized by killing, they will have later to embrace non-killing. They will not be able to keep killing others and they will have to choose non-killing as the main alternative to change this planet, to change the world. Even the structure, non-killing structure, non-killing institutions, non-killing political, political parties, non-killing you know yeah. yeah so the united nations is the is a is a the foundation for social society that we are looking for so what are some of the as you you completed your research what were some of the key takeaways or lessons um that you learned that you're like you know i i went and i i know i want to do my dissertation on non-killing right but and my experience with DuPage has transformed my life. But what were some key takeaways that you you were like, these are life-changing moments for me? Um, that, can change, that can change the lives? For you, for your personal experience, really like this. So, so, oh, from my personal experience, uh, yeah. three things. First, you have to read. If you want to be a non-killing figures or scholars or whatever uh, field you are involved in, you have to train yourself. So I mean, you have to read about non-killing. That is self-education. Yeah. So, um, uh, meeting page was one thing. To really become who I am or the non-killing figures I am, I had to, 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 um, to, to read most of the researches or most of the, the studies done by non-killing uh, uh, people. So for those who want, again, to embrace non-killing, the first thing they have to do is, um, you know, that's why my, 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 my work is important. Uh, um, organizing um, workshop, organizing conference, organizing uh, different... Uh, uh, so don't be afraid of don't be afraid of uh, being attacked by others because you're you 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 you're promoting a, a, a concept that can change the world. That is the, the way I can put it. If I uh, try to, you know, 
to encourage others to embrace this this uh, new concept, this new paradigm. Okay. Don't give me political science is about political science is about life. You know, political science is about life. You know, you see, political science is about life. You're organizing the society. So non-killing political science is a, is a way to organize the society without uh, uh, resorting, uh, uh, without using violence to, to address problems that we will face. So based on your research, what are some practical strategies or approaches that can be employed to promote non-killing for a listener like me, like myself or for any of the listeners who listen to talk with the class, um, what, what can they do to the practices they can um, employ to engage someone that is an anti-nuclear weapon activist or a realist to say, hey, let's think about the concept of non-killing? Yeah, it is... Um... It is not easy uh, to convince them. So we need to be simple with that because uh, the simplicity of the question, is it on killing society possible, show the complexity of the problem uh, of what we have we have to accomplish, which is the non killing global society. So when we are going to discuss that with scholars uh, from other fields like anti-nuclear weapons or scholar in the field of realists or people who believe in war, we have to be simple with them and try to come with evidence to show them that a non-killing global society is possible. That page presents, so I, the, the book of page, non-killing global political science, is like a, a Bible for the field of non-killing political science. So we have to refer to this book, you know, to convince others. So you have to really understand the concept and then try to educate others, try to inform them that he or she has the, the capacity to, to become a non-killing uh, leader or a non-killing scholar or a non-killing whatever you use. Just help them to discover this capacity. That is the challenge or that is what we have to do if you want to approach uh, someone who is not who is a killer or, or a violent person so i think the, the the work of those at the center for global non-killing they have to think every day and that is one of the, my recommendations for this center so they have to think about a manual uh, uh, uh um i would say um a, a book uh, to put the the work of page you know, that can, I mean, convince others, you know, because the book of this is really philosophical, you know, uh, we need to put to write something uh, simpler, so, you know, that can convince others to, to, to embark in the, in the field of non-killing, you know, um, of non-killing political science or non-killing, yeah. So is that, what's, what's on, what's up next for you, or are we going to be seeing you creating that you said it's needed yeah I, I i i'm thinking about it there are so many others uh, so many other scholars who are also working about non-killing manual they think about it you know so we need to make it to make it simple for everyone to understand yeah. because the world is uh, very complicated we can give them complicated reading you know <laughs> that will make it uh, more complex for them to to achieve uh, to embark in the in the process of accomplishing a non-killing global society. Okay, I think the simpler it is, the, the easier it is to to understand and more relatable actually for everyone to understand. Scholars can understand stuff when it's really complicated, but I think like your everyday Joe Schmo, a simple manual will probably help. So what's I mean you've shared such amazing information today. So what's next for you? Next for me, for now, I'm looking for teaching op opportunity, uh, teaching uh, in the field of peace, uh, event security, uh, um, conflict resolution, nuclear disarmament. So now I'm applying for some programs, uh, for some fellowship in the US, uh, in Massachusetts and other universities. I'm waiting for the, the answers. <laughs> 
um, what they will tell me, I don't know. So I keep applying and I keep writing. You know, academia is about publish or perish. So I, yeah. uh, I, I have some articles that have been accepted in some prestigious journal. So now I am, I'm waiting for, I'm, uh, I'm publishing in newspaper about my topic, try to educate the Haitian community about non-killing nuclear disarmament, the threat of nuclear weapons, you know, the threat of killing associated with the existence of nuclear, of nuclear weapons. Uh, actually, there are 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Mm. And then 1%, the use of only 1% can destroy uh, cities, you know. And then uh, we are in a very fragile moment in the, in the, pla in the on the planet. So we need to, 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 to keep thinking about how to uh, mitigate those uh, issues, those threats. So where could we find, you know, if someone wants to connect with you, if a listener says, you know, I'm really interested in learning more about Dr. Joseph and the, the concept of non-killing. So where would we be able to, where would they be able to connect with you? To connect with me if they want to know about the concept? Yes, and read your articles and so forth. I don't know if I can give my email or I don't know. Uh, there is a website at the Center for Global Non-Killing. Uh, there is a website. People can Google it. And it's ccgnk. I don't remember the, the website. Um, so they can Google non-killing and they will find so many information. So I don't have a website, my own website. Maybe I'm thinking about it. Yeah. So they can, um, they, they will find a lot of information about that. And what about LinkedIn? Can they connect with you on LinkedIn? Yeah, LinkedIn, yes. Roland Joseph, yeah, they can connect with me on LinkedIn. So uh, actually, I mean, for now, I have no uh, articles posted on my LinkedIn page. I will do it next, maybe in, in the next couple of weeks. I will try to post something related to non-killing and nuclear disarmament. So, but now the best way to know about non-killing is to go on the website of non-killing of the Center for Global Non-Killing. They will find they will find a lot of resources, even your psychologist, even your in the field of anthropology, international relations, law, music. You will find something related to non-killing. Music. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, all of things. And page, there are more than uh, 700 scholars or thousand scholars connected from, I mean, uh, 300 universities across the planet uh, that are part of this center, Center for Global Non-Killing. Yeah. There are a lot of resources there. So what advice, because you've been through the PhD journey, I'm like in it. <laughs> So what advice would you give to someone who wants to pursue a PhD? You have to really want to, to really know, okay, do I need a PhD? Because mm. PhD means research. And then research, publish books, academic articles, opinions, whatever. So that is the first question. What field I want to? Peace and conflict studies? Go for it. Political science, international relations. So. Uh, the academia is not easy. People say that, and I, I'm experiencing that. <laughs> you can apply for a professor, um, become an assistant professor. It will take time to be to be hired and interview, maybe between three to even five, six months. Mm. Interview you, presenting uh, a lecture. You know, it is very, very challenging. It's not easy. So we have to answer the questions. So if, when you get to the, uh, into the PhD program, you have to be strategic, finish your coursework and know how many courses per semester that you have to take, manage family and, uh, and academia. It's not easy, but what is important is communication. Communicate with your teacher or with your instructor, with your professor, with your faculty members, communicate with them. And then if you have to postpone, you know, and if you have to ask for an ex uh, uh, extension, you have to you can ask the professor, it's okay, I had to submit my homework this week, but I cannot. So can you give me more days, more weeks to finish my essay? So communicate with your, that is the main thing. So after that, prepare to take your, 
your, you have to prepare to get prepared to take the qualifying exam. One of the most important things, the qualifying exam. Some universities you can you can take it maybe uh, three times, some twice. Uh, and if you do not pass, they will give you a master's degree. So that is a I was afraid of that. <laughs> so you <laughs> have to take your qualifying exam. That's one of one of my uh experience that I like at, uh, at the university where I studied. I got my 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 PhD. I went to a hotel and I spent maybe uh, three days. I stayed in the hotel for three days to 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 for the qualifying exam. You know, so we I have think to- I'm gonna go that part. When I heard you say that, I was like, yeah, I think that's what I'm gonna do when it's my turn for your uh, qualifying exam. Yeah, I go to a hotel and just be on lockdown. You already took it, right? No, I have not taken it as oh, yet. Oh, not yet. Okay, you will. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. And then don't forget to to think about your topic in your own way before you meet with your advisor and one of the most important thing is to choose a chair that you will feel comfortable i mean uh, a chair that you think you 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 are comfortable with you know and don't a chair that you don't like you know what i mean all chairs are important they are good but you have to choose one that you say okay for the types of topic for the types of personality that i have i have to choose this person that is the one thing that 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 you one thing that you have to to another thing I think in the committee, uh, for the committee members, you have to choose uh, um, all the committee members. I think they try they should be uh, in harmony. You know, the, uh, if there is no harmony between if there is no harmonization between all of them, that it will be maybe difficult for you. Okay, to, you know that's that's great advice, but I don't I don't see how you can. Let how do you let them be in harmony? No, be be careful when when you when you will uh, talk to your first advisor. I mean your chair. They they will let you know that a little bit, but you have to be smart to understand. Yeah, got it. I'm going to choose. Yeah. He or she will tell you. In my uh, you will tell the professor. My community. I have Warren. I have X. Okay. Roland, okay, <laughs> someone, you know, why you choose Roland? Since we have the, since we see the professor, we ask those questions, you have to be careful. Yeah, got uh, it. And present a list of committee members and they will, okay, I think this person is good. Yeah. But okay, take Kedja, take Roland, okay, your committee is good, you know? Yeah. So when you choose some people that professor would feel not comfortable, that is another thing. You got know, it. Like got always, it. they are in discussion. They interact. You know, yeah. You, for your defense, they will never finish. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's great advice. So let me ask you this: mm-hmm. dead or alive? So you have a dead option or an alive option. Which three people have been the most influential people to you throughout your journey, and why did you? Was, what is the first one? Dead. If, so you can choose someone that's either dead or alive. Okay. So top three, which three people have been the most influential people in your life uh, throughout your entire career path, educational path, you know, that specific journey? And why did you choose them? I think my mother. <laughs> he said, I think my mom. <laughs> um, um, yeah, uh, my, my, mom, my mom is alive. Um, Dr. Max Fall and my wife, and they play very well. You asked me to choose three? Three. Three. Yeah. So, so you yeah. said you, cho- you chose your mom and you I chose your wife. Hey, for sure. Yeah, there's another one. And, uh, and that's actually a, a great decision for the non killing section of it. <laughs> yeah, because uh, my wife uh, pushed me a lot. Uh, yeah. Uh, she always said, okay, well, then do what you want, you know? Yeah. And in the US, uh, encouraged me. Well, don't kill is a good thing. Uh, she never discouraged me in this uh, in this way. <laughs> okay. And then what's the uh, what was the what was the last? You said doctor. I didn't. Hear, was that doctor? My, my, my mother. My mother is that part of that. Yeah, your mom. Yeah, my mom. Uh, my professor, Doctor Max Paul, and my I said my wife. Yeah, and your wife. Three great, three great um, choices. Mm-hmm. So if you, we've we've reached the stage, let's say at the end of your story, well, for this podcast, because this is not your full stop, right? 
So if you could ask one question that I did not ask you today, what would be that question and what would be your answer to that question? <laughs> wow. What my question I would say, I, I, I did not expect this question. So I think uh, one question you should ask was, I have to answer anyway. You have to answer it. You wanted it asked. I didn't ask it. So now is your turn to say, I am the interviewer. You remember you have you you were a journalist. So which question do you want to you you said, you know, Katie, you skipped this question and I wanted to talk about it. I would tell I would say, why didn't you choose a topic related to Haiti? Ooh, that's a really good one. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. <laughs> Why didn't you choose a topic related to Haiti, but you choose non-killing? Mm -hmm. that, that, that should be my question. So and what's your answer? And you have to answer it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my answer will be like, because Haiti is under the threat of killing uh, with their weapons. Yeah. Because if there's a nuclear war, Haiti will affect directly or indirectly. Uh, directly because there are a lot of Haitians living in the United States. So if, if the United States of America has been attacked by another nuclear country or by another nuclear state, there will be, you know, a lot of Haitian, Haitian uh, a lot of people in the Haitian community that will die or whatever. They will affect by the nuclear radiation. So, you know, uh, those Haitian people, they send a lot of money in Haiti that will affect the country. So yeah. I think uh, uh, my topic encompasses to some extent uh, the problem of the world, including my country. Yeah. Yeah, that's oh, wow. why uh, choosing Haiti might not be uh, it's a very good thing, but uh, my topic encompasses also my dissertation encompasses also Haiti. Got it, so got I, it, got I, it. I, I am addressing the, the world problem, not the, the problem of a specific country. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I would love to have you back just to hear a little bit more about what's going on, like what your, your thoughts are, especially with between Haiti and the DR, with the whole canal thing that's going on. Would love to hear your, your viewpoint on that. And also with, the political crisis right now in, in Haiti with your dissertation on non-killing, you know, how would you take that approach in Haiti? Yeah, I, 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 I started a project, working on a project on that, uh, on a paper, I mean, to submit okay. to an organization, you know. Haiti really need, uh, needs uh, the concept of non-killing. Yeah. It's called what now? Because... Uh, so many gun violence in Haiti and uh, Port-au-Prince is difficult to, the situation is worse, become worse every day. And I'm from the southeast of Haiti. So every day I'm thinking about where I'm going to, which way I'm going to use to go to my, to my hometown. So to Jackmel. So it is very difficult. So, and those gangsters, those, those young people who have, who blocked uh, Port-au-Prince right now, they are they have been all in school so developing a non-killing program in high school in elementary school is the best thing that i should initiate in haiti yeah in the future so we need that and even though regarding the dominican republic uh, issue we are construct a canal in our side in our land, and there is a, 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 a the river is for us, it's for the Dominican Republic, this is for Haiti too. So we are constructing a canal in our side, and Dominican Republic already constructed made so many yeah. canals. So they, political leaders, they need non killing political science to non killing politics. Yeah. yeah. So you see, you know that uh, uh, Dominican people, we are our blood and sisters. We share the island. We live together. Your problem is supposed to be my problem. My problem is supposed to be your, yours. Even for the United States of America, even for Canada, even for France. This is such this solidarity 
that we need to develop in the world. We are all connected, interconnected with each other. Yeah. We function, as our professor Bernard used to say, as a system. We're a system. I mean, we are connected. When hate doesn't work, it will impact hate. Uh, VR. In America or any other country. So many yeah. nations leave Haiti to come here. Yeah. If you help Haiti and Haiti help you, no, we have friends and have friends without dominating us. That is the world of conflict <laughs> resolution. And that is why non-killing conflict resolution is important. It, it, it really is. We did not we do not have to 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 kill others e either uh, directly or indirectly directly and or uh, or indirectly to to the structure that you put in place so your structure that you put in place supposed to be in the benefit of all others of all people in the planet it's important that we need to 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 eliminate all threats, including nuclear threats, all threats of killing, including nuclear weapons. And we should do that before those weapons eliminate us. Oh, yes. So if we do not do it together, we develop a sort of synergy to, to let, to help political politicians, political leaders, presidents, ministers, secretary of state, whatever, understand that they have the capacity to eliminate those weapons and start living together, start educating people everywhere in the world, from the very beginning to, to, to university. From right. Then to university. Because so you some, see... Some professors, some politicians, they need to be educated. Too. So that is why, Dr. Joseph, it is very important for you to go out and do that manual. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very, very important for you to do that manual. You know, it, it's you don't simplify it and get it out there. And you know, because you've shared such a wealth of information with us, and it affect, it affects us in so in all areas of our lives. If you think about it, I, I will, I will, I will try to to bring something, um, make it simple as I can. For the, I, I publish a lot in Haitian Creole because I want all people to understand me. To understand. And then I, I will try to, to, to publish some in English, in French, for other people in, in the world, in the US, wherever. Okay. The world. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We, we would love to have you back. You know, we would love to have you back. So, but thank you so much for coming on and spending time with us and educating us about the concept, the non-killing uh, concept, right? And sharing your dissertation, sharing your, your findings and your ideas with us. I am sure listeners enjoyed tremendously um, learning from you. So again, you're welcome back anytime. And thank you so much for taking some time to talk with Clads. Thank you so much. So hope they will understand my accent. Yeah, they sure will. <laughs> I have an accent. I have an accent. So you know, certain <laughs> words, it's, it's very difficult for me to to um, pronounce. I have to be like in my head going, "Oh, you know." They say Jamaicans eat their eat the H. Yeah. So when they say her, it's her. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I I, 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 it was amazing. Your questions. Um, thank you for your for your questions. So great, great, great questions. So I hope. I will have uh, the opportunity to answer to more questions with the non killing uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, for taking some time to talk with Pat. Bye, guys. <laughs>